Sintag. This is a history of Maryland, episode three of Carmelites and Kings. Over the next two podcasts, we're going to be wandering into a hazy and mysterious period in the story of Sir George Calvert's life. Between April of 1625 and about June of 1627, some really big stuff is going down in regards to Calvert's colonization efforts in Newfoundland. But there are frustratingly huge holes in the historical record missing puzzle pieces that will require a little bit of speculation to fill in the gaps. To add to the general confusion, British foreign policy is now firmly in the incapable hands of our friend George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. And we're in for a bewildering series of military disasters coming at us thick and fast, as well as some Olympic-grade diplomatic flip-flopping between England, Spain, and the participants of a French civil war that Buckingham will involve England on both sides of. All of this will hinder Calvert's ability to properly attend to his colony of Avalon in Newfoundland. Instead, Calvert and his family will cross over to their estates in Ireland. And I'm happy to report, I've actually been able to scrape together a few tiny tidbits of information about these estates and his time there which includes finally solving the mystery of why he was dubbed Lord Baltimore when his lands weren't anywhere near the Irish town of Baltimore. We're also going to meet Calvert's new wife, Joan, because there's a wedding in there somewhere, though we're not specifically sure when. And this first Lady Baltimore is someone who's all but completely slipped through the cracks of history, and we'll talk a little bit about why. While Calvert can't yet make it to Avalon himself, he will manage to outfit another expedition in May 1625 to replace his current governor, Edward Wynne, with a battle-hardened Catholic knight and soldier of fortune named Sir Arthur Aston. And this is where the historical record gets even choppier. The super spooky mystery we have to solve is, why is Edward Wynne being replaced? When exactly is this happening? What does Sir Arthur Aston have to do with any of this? And what did he actually do while he was in Newfoundland? And probably the biggest question of all is, what happened to the colonists? Because, spoiler alert, when Calvert finally arrives personally at his colony in the summer of 1627, it's empty. One of the few primary sources we have for this whole foggy period will be Father Simon Stock, the same priest who claims to have converted Calvert and helped him name his colony. And he's going to claim all sorts of stuff. He is a biased, often misinformed source who has an agenda. But in a lot of cases, he's all we got. And for our tiny little historical niche, he's essential to what we know about the Avalon colony in this period. Stock would spend much of 1625 and early 1626 petitioning a new organization in Rome dedicated to the spread of Catholicism in all the non-Catholic sectors of the planet, be it Asia or be it England. This organization was referred to at the time as the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, or De Propaganda Fide. And Simon Stock is going to try to pander to their motives and mission statements in order to drum up aid for Calvert's venture. Specifically, he'll be looking for priests actually willing to go to Newfoundland. The story of Father Simon Stock will also introduce us to a factional dispute going on in the English Catholic underground a jurisdictional spat between the Catholic orders on one side and the secular clergy led by the new vicar apostolic Richard Smith on the other. Richard Smith is essentially trying to pull rank and act as a bishop over all Catholics in England. And this controversy will infect the entire English Catholic community and will ultimately lead to George Calvert aligning himself with the Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits. And this relationship will be instrumental in the founding of Maryland and in its early history. The period between April 1625 and June 1627 can be murky indeed. A lot of Maryland histories give it only a few sentences or skip it altogether. But we here at A History of Maryland represent the cream of historical podcasting with dozens of downloads and almost two countries. I feel like I personally owe it to all five of you to present the most comprehensive narrative possible. Though this be a tiny blip of time, it is chock full of moving parts and alternate possibilities. And though the historical record is incomplete, we're going to spend just a little bit of our precious and fleeting time on this planet speculating about what actually happened. What was Calvert's true mindset and motivation in carrying on with his Avalon colony? 
Was he just an innocent, naive dreamer throughout all this? Or had he become too personally invested himself in the project to turn back, even when it became clear that his prospects weren't all they were cracked up to be? Maybe he just had to try to keep up appearances in order to secure more investors and the king's good graces. Well, there's only one way to find this out. So gas up the mystery machine, crack open a box of Scooby Snacks, and let's head into this old abandoned mine shaft to see if we can find any clues. When we last left Sir George Calvert, it was late March, early April 1625, in London. His sovereign and benefactor James I had just died, and James's son, Charles I, had just inherited the throne. Charles and his court favorite, the Duke of Buckingham, are currently involved in intense and complex negotiations with France over his coming marriage with Henrietta Maria, and a proposed military alliance between England and France versus Spain. This relationship has already been a rocky one. King James I and King Louis XIII had already had a falling out over the disastrous siege of Breda in February 1625, which we talked a bit about in episode 2.2. To keep the alliance on track, Charles had secretly agreed to grant toleration to Catholics in England and to no longer enforce the penal laws, something he had specifically promised the English Parliament in 1624 that he wouldn't do. The Protestant opposition in Parliament attack any perceived leniency towards Catholics. They withhold further funding for the coming war against Spain, and they crank up the heat on Papists wherever they can. Charles I spends the next several months flip-flopping on an almost weekly basis between trying to please the French by being nice to Catholics and trying to please Parliament by being tough on them, and he mostly manages to fail making anyone happy. So it's an interesting time historically, where, depending on the source, Charles I was either scandalously colluding with foreign Catholic powers to grant English Catholics unprecedented and deeply disturbing levels of favor and tolerance, or he was behind one of the worst clampdowns on English Catholics since 1606. Throughout these months, there are simultaneous reports from ambassadors and priests about Charles I ignoring his promises to protect Catholics. And on the other side, Protestants are expressing their deep concern about his amnesty towards recusants. And there are examples you can find that justify both viewpoints. For now, though, from our perspective, Calvert is going to be feeling the rough end of this dichotomy. First, he's barred, along with any other avowed Catholic of any rank, from attending James's funeral. Then, as a member of the Privy Council, he is immediately required to give oaths of allegiance and of supremacy to his new king. And I just want to gab for a second about these oaths. The Stuart kings often get painted as pro-Catholic, especially by their political enemies, who ultimately won. But it wasn't remotely that simple. James and Charles could be just as rapacious in enforcing the anti-Catholic penal laws, especially when they're trying to get along with Parliament. Other times, they seemed relatively pleasant to their lay Catholic subjects. This almost always coincided with international diplomacy between England and the Catholic powers of France and Spain. Lay English Catholics were essentially pawns in a constantly changing political landscape. But the clergy usually remained a target. Imprisonment, banishment, and even execution still awaited Catholic priests found in England during these years. For the absolutist Stuarts, the Roman Church represented a foreign contagion, which challenged the absolute sovereignty of the monarch. And one concept in particular that they could not abide by was the idea that the Pope had the moral, spiritual, and legal authority to call for the overthrow of a divinely ordained monarch. This had happened to Queen Elizabeth. Pope Pius V excommunicated her and encouraged her subjects to rise up and overthrow her. Suddenly, any cluster of English Catholics was a potential sleeper cell of terrorists, at least in the eyes of the Protestant authorities. And this is one of the things that the Oath of Allegiance was designed to confront. You had to publicly declare whose side you were on in regard to the Pope's authority to depose a king. And oaths at this time are a big deal. Beyond the spiritual principles that were very tangible and immediate to extremely religious people, there was the enormous pressure from your entire social safety net of church, friends, and family to do the right thing. 
And the right thing for Catholics to do, according to most popes and bishops, was to refuse this oath, which could get you into heaps of trouble, depending on how the political winds were blowing that day. But there was a tiny bit of wiggle room from time to time. Every once in a while, a pope or an archpriest would take a pragmatic stance and give the laity leave to just go ahead and take the oath of allegiance. Another strategy was to change the wording ever so slightly so as not to offend their sensibilities. Many Catholics weren't opposed to swearing allegiance to the king as their temporal lord. It's all that other stuff, dissing the pope and the church they couldn't swear to. Both George and Cecil Calvert were big proponents of this solution, and each would try it out on a few occasions. But generally speaking, you were supposed to take one on the chin for the Roman church and refuse outright, and there was plenty of social enforcement of this. Getting thrown into the clink and having your property seized was a badge of honor for seriously devout recusants. Now, oaths of supremacy, they were a little different. They were way more straightforward. By taking this oath, you declare the monarch as the supreme head of the church, as the final arbiter in all matters of religion. And for Catholics, plain and simple, that's the Pope's job. There's no wiggle room there. Take this oath, and you're basically declaring you're not a Catholic. So Calvert couldn't really take these oaths. Not if he wanted to maintain any of his personal religious principles, and not if he wanted to maintain any street cred with the community of English Catholics he was currently immersing himself in. King Charles respected his honesty, but still showed him the door. Now in fairness, I have to say that a lot of the sources have a different version of events here. More often than not, it is written that Charles wanted to keep Calvert on in the Privy Council, and that he was willing to forego all of these oaths. Oh, not you, George. You're one of the good ones. Forget all that silly oath business. We'll ride out to the lodge and do some falconing. But in this version, Calvert wants to step down, and he asks his sovereign permission to leave the Privy Council, presumably so he could focus full-time on his colony of Avalon. So that's the other story, and you can take your pick. But I find John D. Krugler's assessment of the situation more convincing. In his book, English and Catholic, which is still the most in-depth and invaluable resource I have on the Calverts, he notes that this version of the story is a later version, which comes ultimately from the Calvert family. King Charles had dismissed six other council members along with Sir George Calvert, so he appears to be cleaning house, and he's probably replacing them with Buckingham's people. It's a fairly safe bet that no matter what Charles personally thought of Calvert, Buckingham found an easy way to boot the old Spanish party stalwart out, make him take an oath of supremacy just like everyone else. And this won't be the last time this little trick will be used on George Calvert by his political opponents. And I also agree with Krugler's assessment that Calvert wanted to keep his honorary place in the Privy Council. He just felt that he couldn't. But in the meantime, he's still able to run off the fumes of his own influence and reputation. And despite being out of the Privy Council, despite a looming war with Spain, which restricted freedom of movement and the availability of ships, and despite his open Catholicism, Calvert was able to put together an expedition to his colony in Avalon. In March 1625, just before the death of James I, Calvert had secured the use of two ships in order to travel to Avalon, provided that they would be returned to England ten days after landing, with a cargo full of fish for the English Navy. England was on the cusp of war with Spain. Use of sailing vessels was restricted, in case they were needed to thwart an invasion or some such thing. And the voyages that were allowed had to serve some practical use for the war effort. Though James's death briefly cast everything in doubt, the next month, Calvert is able to reobtain permission from the new Privy Council. Only this time, he would be sending Sir Arthur Aston in his stead. And this time, the release of the two ships hinged not on a cargo full of fish, but on the stipulation that Aston returned with some elks and some hawks for the king. So, new king, new priorities. Pretty much all the sources agree that there's a bit of regime change going on in Avalon, and that Edward Wynne is being relieved of his post. A fair question to ask is why? What happened? When we last heard from Wynne, it was all sizzling steaks and creamy cakes. Everything was proceeding nicely in the colony, and the sky was the limit. Well, this is one of those soupy bits that will be plaguing today's podcast, 
and therefore some speculation must ensue. In the more benign interpretations, the colony was just entering a new phase of development, and Wynne simply didn't have all the requisite qualifications to take it to the next level. You know, nothing personal, just business. One of those qualifications may have been religion. Wynne was a Protestant, and though Protestants were not only welcome in Calvert's colonies, they were necessarily a majority, Calvert was the Lord Proprietor. It was his government. And surely his intention was to rule via a Catholic aristocracy. This is exactly why Sir Arthur Aston was chosen as a potential governor. As we'll see, he's a man of some social rank in England and some renown within the Catholic community. He's a man of action and experience, and his Catholic credentials are top tier. Installing Aston as governor of Avalon sends a clear message about how Calvert wants his colony to be run, and Wynne just doesn't fit the specifications. But there are some more malign interpretations. Edward Wynne was just not living up to his promises. After years of glowing reports, and who knows how much money and supplies, he'd failed to make the colony sustainable, let alone profitable. George Calvert would ultimately blame his failures in colonizing Newfoundland on those he had trusted to manage it for him. By Calvert's reckoning, he'd been lied to and ripped off by a bunch of lazy and deceitful hucksters. Dear Lord Baltimore, everything's going great. Please send more money. Hey Ed, tell him to send some beer. P.S. Please send two strong maids that can brew and bake. There's no smoking gun, but there are a few context clues which could back this up. An important one being Calvert's eventual decision to travel to Avalon himself. He writes Wentworth in 1627, basically admitting the whole thing's going down the toilet unless he gets over there personally and saves it. Somewhere between all of those upbeat letters about wonderful prospects and progress being made in 1621 and 1622, and our current position in the narrative in 1625, something has gone pear-shaped. At the very least, Wynne's letters are deceptively optimistic in the picture it paints of Newfoundland. And if you think about it, he doesn't have much, if any, incentive to tell Calvert anything but good news. Keeps him gamefully employed and keeps the investment money rolling in. But at some point, Calvert's going to notice that he's not getting anything back on his investment. According to fellow colonizer William Vaughn, Captain Wynne returned to England in 1624. Was he recalled by Calvert? Or did he just quit? And did the 30 or so colonists return with him? I think there's a pretty good chance they did. And that they might be the reason Wynne was canned. Maybe things got bad fast and he couldn't control them or induce them to stay. Maybe this is why Calvert looked to a tougher figure, like Sir Arthur Aston. We know just enough to know that anything's possible. It might also be possible that it's just really hard to colonize Newfoundland, and that Calvert was a bit deluded about all that, and that he needed someone to throw under the bus when he couldn't make it work himself. Sure, Wynne told some serious pork pies when he wrote about how great a place Avalon Peninsula was for plantation. But Calvert may have wanted him to because he was more than happy to use those letters to rope in other big spenders into the venture. They were published in Westward Ho for Avalon. It's advertising. If it's an unrealistic portrayal of Calvert's colony, there's a reasonably good chance Calvert at least had some idea it was unrealistic. The point is to project enough optimism to drum up enough capital to make it all work. Two interesting things about Captain Wynne which thicken the plot a little. Five or six years down the road, he'll still be cheerleading for colonization in Newfoundland. Also around that same time, his daughter, Mary Wynne, will actually be a servant in Calvert's household. And we know all this thanks to something of a scandal involving her and Calvert. Now, I'm not going to get all tabloid and exploitative about it. It's just an awkward little scenario that might just be the 17th century's most salaciously sensational sexcapade! Because, of course, there's a sex scandal. You know, you think you can get away from the news for just like five seconds, bury your head in a history book, but oftentimes history is just fossilized news. Anyway, you'll have to wait till 1632 for all of the lurid details. Here in 1625, the one thing that's safe to say is that Wynne is out as governor. 
and that Sir Arthur Aston is heading to Avalon to weigh up the prospects of staying on as governor himself. This is basically a test run. He wants to spend the few months there before deciding whether or not it's worth getting serious and staying the winner. And most importantly, he's going to act as a trusted pair of eyes and hands for those with a stake in this venture. They're all anxiously awaiting his judgment on the matter. Sir Arthur Aston is an interesting chap. Well, we know of him anyway. In keeping with the soupy theme of today's episode, he's a really tough guy to research, especially via search engines, mostly because of his name. First off, there's a Sir Arthur Ashton kicking around at the exact same time who was ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. A Sir William Aston, part of a Catholic family of Astons that apparently aren't immediately related to our Aston. But what really mucks things up is that Sir Arthur Aston has a much more famous son with the same name, the same title, and the same general career arc. Students of Irish history in particular will probably know this younger Sir Arthur Aston, the storied Catholic soldier of fortune battling the Turks in Europe, who will fight for the Royalist cause in the English Civil Wars, and who ultimately ends up as the commander of a Royalist garrison holed up in the Irish town of Drogheda in 1649. This is that young Ned of the Hill era of Irish history, where Oliver Cromwell and his parliamentary army is burning a punitive swath through Ireland. And when Cromwell takes the town, he gives no quarter to the surrendering royalists. And Sir Arthur Aston Jr. will famously be beaten to death with his own wooden leg. Sir Arthur Aston Sr. was also a Catholic soldier of fortune, and he'll also die horribly fighting for the king. He reportedly spent much of the 1610s as a mercenary in Russia and Poland, fighting mostly against the Turks. Many sources have him at the head of 8,000 men there, holding back the advance of the Sultan. Probably a wild exaggeration, but at the very least he knows how to get a good press. In 1621, James seems to have given his blessing to a plan hatched by the Polish ambassador to have Aston raise an army of 10,000 men from all of James's domains in England, Scotland, and Ireland in order to fight against the Turks for Catholic Poland. Now, it may seem crazy that plans like this are being discussed in Protestant England, but James was gaga for this crusader stuff. The Ottoman Empire are a big threat to Eastern and Central Europe at this point. And James has some very romantic notions about all of Christendom putting aside its differences to unite against the common enemy. So in typical Stuart fashion, he pledges a bunch of money he doesn't have and gets himself further into trouble with the opposition in Parliament. For Protestant patriots, the Spanish and Austrian Habsburgs were the real enemy, and the Turkish Sultan was the Habsburgs' enemy. Opposition to the plan also included the merchants and investors of the Levant Company, who were making bank by trading with the Ottomans, so it was not popular. But James pushes ahead with it. So, in typical Stuart fashion, it's a total fiasco. Only a fraction of the money is raised. Of the promised 10,000 men, only about 2,000 are raised, mostly Irish Catholics. And most of them will be stopped in Danish territory. Only a few hundred make it to Poland, where, under the command of Arthur Aston Jr., They'll be used not against the Muslim Turks, but against the Orthodox Christian Russians. King James gets an earful about this from the Russian ambassador, and Sir Arthur Aston Sr. finds himself declared culpable and tossed in the jail by King James. At almost the same time this Polish ambassador is trying to drum up a mercenary army with Sir Arthur Aston, he's also working to secure the release of imprisoned English Catholic recusants who had refused to give oaths of allegiance and supremacy. And the gatekeeper to King James in this whole affair will be then Secretary of State Sir George Calvert. In diplomatic dispatches at the time, Aston, Calvert, and the Spanish ambassador, Count Gondomar, are being mentioned in the same breath. So if they didn't know each other before, Calvert and Aston most likely met around this time. Aston is out of jail and back on the streets in a few days. And a few years later, he'll be around to get himself involved with this prospective colony in Newfoundland whose Lord Proprietor was former Secretary of State Sir George Calvert, newly converted to the true faith, and newly risen into the Irish peerage. Among the chattering classes, word is spreading about this Baron of Baltimore, and the potential haven of tolerance he's trying to set up in the newfound land. Lord of his personal fiefdom by the King's Charter, 
ready and willing to bestow lands, titles, and lucrative inducements to any English Catholic gentleman ambitious enough to get in on the ground floor. So Aston signs on, and in May 1625, he's ready to set sail for Avalon. We know Calvert stays in London until Aston departs. So I'll go ahead and imagine him there on the docks that day, seeing off Aston and the two ships that would be carrying Calvert's hopes and dreams of successful plantation in the New World. Perhaps he watches as the sails disappear into the distance, already feeling the first pangs of impatience, the all-consuming desire for some sort of news that this whole crazy venture was going to work out. That first letter that might alleviate his anxieties and set his mind spinning once more with visions of a rich fiefdom across the sea. A land where he was liege lord to all but the king of England himself. And when those sails had finally sunk behind the glittering horizon line of a bejeweled sea, it was time to get the hell out of there. The plague was in town. Bubonic plague. Black death. Yersinia pestis. It had broken out in London in the early spring, and week by week it picked up steam, becoming a true epidemic by the summer months. There are so many good podcasts out there on bubonic plague, I'm not going to bother going into much detail. Seriously, if you're interested in knowing the grisly details of how the plague works and what it can do, just pause this now and go check out The History of Byzantium, Episode 27. It's one you should know. There were two particularly infamous outbreaks of bubonic plague in Europe. The first being the Justinian Plague of 541 and 542, and the Black Death in the 1340s. These outbreaks are the ones associated with those terrifying statistics. In some localities, 80% of the population is snuffed out in a year or so. It pulped 30-60% to of the entire population of Europe. These plagues raged all through Asia, the Middle East, Africa, taking 10 to 20% of the world's population with them. So many people dying so traumatically for no understandable reason in such a short space of time just fundamentally impacts human history, society, economics, religion, etc. in a kaleidoscope of ways, and we can still trace the ripple effects today. But these are just the initial pandemic impacts of the disease. The thing about the plague is that it just keeps coming back. For three or four centuries after each major outbreak, it flares back up, here and there, going after that next generation who weren't resistant to the bacteria. The London Plague of 1625 and 1626 was one of these flare-ups. Though it wouldn't reach the death tolls of even the Great Plague of London in 1666, Don't let this diminish the sense of apocalyptic fear and gloom this outbreak would have cast over the entire kingdom. It killed 35,000 in London alone. Rough guesstimate, that's about 10% of the city's population. And that's just the fatalities. A significant percentage of plague victims would survive. There are 30,000 more plague deaths throughout England in that year's time, and probably more as aftershocks crept into more remote areas over the following year or so. If you lived in and around London, plague was either in your house or affecting someone you knew personally. And even if you lived in North Yorkshire, you were probably barring your doors and living in dread of any sneeze, sniffle, or flush of heat on your forehead. And in either case, all you could really do was just pray. Beyond quasi-scientific theories about the plague being caused by foul air... Most sensible people could only see this as an act of God. God was not happy. And there were plenty of ready-made reasons depending on who you were. Catholics saw it as God's anger against the recent Protestant clampdown. Puritans saw it as God's anger at the base crypto-popery of the state church. Anglican Protestants probably blamed Puritan pride or some kind of Catholic sorcery. And there was probably more than a few furrowed brows and clandestine mutterings on how the plague had followed the ascension of Charles I. It's not the most auspicious start to a reign. And Charles was having trouble even calling a parliament in 1625 because so many MPs were refusing to even travel to London while death stalked its streets. Efforts to contain the infections were failing miserably, and travel and trade by land or sea were becoming severely restricted. News and lines of communication broke down, with only rumor and paranoia to fill the void. There were already stories floating around about the king himself coming down with the plague, 
and an imminent invasion by the Spanish to add fuel to Londoners' fears and despair. Luckily for Calvert, the king had granted him and his family and retinue passage into Ireland, and they packed their things and set off for the Emerald Isle once Aston had sailed. George Calvert will disappear off the historical radar until September of 1625, and it will be some months until we hear anything from Aston about Avalon. So let's leave those threads of the narrative behind as we delve into the often shadowy world of Catholicism in England at this time, and properly meet Father Simon Stock, a champion for the potential of the Catholic colony of Avalon, and one of the few historical sources we have for this portion of our narrative. So, uh, for the ladies and gentlemen in the audience, not mentioning certain people, uh, or not, we will sing a little, have a little bit of religion. Roman Catholicism is one of the fundamental ingredients of the story of Maryland in regards to its creation, its early years, and to its legacy of religious tolerance. So it's probably to the detriment of this podcast that I'm not Catholic, nor was I raised Catholic, nor do I bring any intrinsic knowledge of it, whether it's the specific tenets and rituals of the faith or the structural workings of the church. So if I seriously bone anything up about it, I just ask that you keep your phasers on stun. I'm learning this stuff as I go. What I can bring to the table is a certain outsider's fascination with the mechanics of the Roman church. And in the case of early 17th century England, the way the Roman church interacted politically with nations, within nations, and within itself. The church is ancient, and it is huge. And underneath all of the faith and spirituality and devotion is a massive human organization with its own bureaucracies, hierarchies, and factions. And this is super cool for two reasons. From a history standpoint, this means more sources because churchmen were always writing stuff down and filing it away somewhere. So much history comes from church records. But it also adds a whole new political dimension to the narrative. Catholics in England were by necessity a secretive subculture. The huge international church apparatus had to be a little more subtle in attending to its flock in England. It had to go underground. And that means we have a conspiracy. Now that's a loaded term these days, and I don't mean conspiracy like Just what is the Vatican hiding about the alien abduction of JFK? I just mean, by simple definition, Catholicism in England was an international conspiracy. Catholic worship was explicitly banned in England and Scotland. This left the Catholic laity stranded. They couldn't just strike out on their own with a vernacular Bible. They needed a properly ordained priesthood to properly administer the sacraments, to perform mass, to hear confession, and generally guide the faithful through life as every church of every denomination did back in those days. And the Catholic Church duly tried to provide some personnel and some structure for the English faithful. Throughout all the years that the penal laws were in place, England would be infiltrated by Catholic priests who were ordained by orders and seminaries across the channel. There are two basic subsets of the clergy, the regulars and the seculars. And while they were nominally working hand in hand in their clandestine efforts to protect and propagate the true faith in that kingdom of heresy, there was a growing factional antagonism coming between them, which will affect our narrative. The regular clergy were those belonging to the monastic or religious orders, like the Benedictines or the Jesuits. And regular in this instance isn't describing something normal or plain. It means more like regulatory. On top of being subject to the canon law of the Pope, these religious orders had their own strict rules, regiments, and vows to abide by. The secular clergy are those ordained priests who didn't belong to a monastic order or religious institute. And the term secular clergy sounds a bit like an oxymoron to me, but the idea is they're, they're not holed up in a monastery. They're out there amongst the people. The seculars were also part of the general hierarchy of the Roman church, from pope down through the bishops to deacons and priests. All things being equal, seculars were supposed to outrank regulars. Sort of like a big corporate conglomerate. The suits from the main corporate office usually carry more weight than the suits from a subsidiary company. Or at least that's how it might work in a Catholic country. But this is all quite illegal in England at this time. There are no monasteries or Catholic parish churches. Mostly, priests are hiding out in people's attics. 
or in some cases in foreign embassies on English soil. There is also no bishop or clear, firm church hierarchy in the country at this time, a fact which rankles most of the secular clergy and many English lay Catholics. Generally, the regulars were more successful at getting a toehold in England than their secular counterparts. The Jesuits, in particular, were already like the Green Berets of missionary work. Just hand them a flashlight and a buck knife, parachute them behind enemy lines, and they'll locate friendly locals and cobble together a resistance in a few months. They were highly educated, highly trained, and backed by a rich and powerful order. Their strategy in the late 16th and early 17th century was to attach themselves to the English Catholic nobility and gentry. Those people with the money and the connections to keep themselves out of too much trouble with the law and who could also afford to hide and maintain the priests. The children of these nobles and gentry were often sent over to the Catholic kingdoms of Europe to get a proper Catholic education. There were English-speaking schools for priests in Rome, a few in Spain, and in Brussels. These graduates would be ordained as priests and then smuggle themselves back into England to begin their missionary work. Thomas Doty was one such English Catholic missionary. He was born around 1576 into a Catholic family of some means. And like many others of that ilk, he escaped legal persecution by slipping over the channel into Europe. He began his education at the English College in Rome in 1606. And by 1613, he joined a relatively new religious order called the Discalced Carmelites of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. And discalced means without shoes or barefoot, meaning they lived by an even more strict and austere set of rules and literally went around in bare feet or sandals and a display of humility and piety. So Thomas was no doubt a zealous and driven guy. He would take on the name Simon Stock, which happens to be the name of an important saint to the Carmelites. And this is standard operating procedure. Catholic priests in England used aliases, often symbolic ones. And he'd be the first in his order to slip back into heretic England in 1615. And secrecy and subterfuge would be of the utmost importance in the world Father Simon was sneaking into. The era of the great spy masters like William and Robert Cecil were a few years in the past. But Jacobean England still had a formidable surveillance state in operation, with the muscle and reach to bring the hammer speedily down on anyone, anywhere in the kingdom. But even if the king was in a tolerant mood, it wasn't necessarily safer for Catholics. The king only represents one tier of the law. Despite all the absolutist rhetoric, the Stuarts were not all-powerful. Regional and local authorities were all active in priest hunting and turning the legal screws on recusants. And this persecution was fueled not only by feverish levels of paranoia and bigotry, but also by economic incentive. There were these sort of religious narcs called pursuivants, acting on tips from undercover agents, turncoat informants, and nosy neighbors. They'd come to your door, knock it down, and ransack the place, looking for any incriminating evidence of your Catholicism. If they couldn't find any, they might just pay a witness to say that you tried to convert their children or something. And then they'd either just shake you down for something shiny or haul you off to jail. Either way, they were going to make some money out of this. Legal penalties for recusancy were mostly based around fines and property seizures. And in many places, the law explicitly rewards informants and pursuivants with the money and property of the Catholics they had turned in. <laughs> Recusancy fines were ruinous for poor to middling Catholics. And this is really how Catholicism in England was squeezed down. From being a significant minority, maybe as high as 30 to 40 percent of the population around the reign of Mary, to a very small minority by the beginning of Charles's reign. Just how small? Well, the estimates are all over the damn place. But I've seen them as low as 1 percent, which seems impossibly low to me all the way up to 20% of the population, which has to be way too high, probably double way too high. In the mid-1630s, a papal envoy would estimate 150,000 Catholics in England, as well as 500 secular priests and about 300 regulars from the various orders, mostly Jesuit and Benedictine. If those numbers are anywhere near accurate, they probably actually represent an uptick in the number of Catholics from our point in the narrative. By the 1630s, Buckingham had passed from the scene, and Charles had become much closer to his French Catholic wife, and things are easing up for Catholics, at least those in and around Charles's court. I'm personally comfortable with the figure like 1-2% to of the population being avowed Catholics, 
with maybe another 2 to 4% of the population who'd convert back to the Roman church in a heartbeat if the penal laws magically disappeared. But don't quote me on those figures because I'm pulling them out of the ether. I get paid to skin salmon, not to research 17th century religious demographics. Point being, though, the penal laws generally worked. Most people conformed. Poor Catholics who didn't ended up penniless and in jail. And penniless in jail was not somewhere you wanted to be in those days, because you actually had to pay yourself for the luxury of being incarcerated and being properly fed. And that's a hole you might not ever come out of unless some benefactor could negotiate for your release. Those who defiantly remained Catholic tended to be the ones who could afford to. That's why Catholicism has taken on an air of being a rich person's religion at the time. By the beginning of Charles's reign, the recusancy fines which had originally been designed to break the backs of the Catholic nobility and gentry had evolved. They had streamlined and become more manageable for those with the means to pay. Charles didn't want to bleed rich Catholics dry. He just wanted to, you know, wet his beak a little. And they became another source of income to the cash-starved king. These Catholics who could pay received some measure of protection in return. And despite the occasional clampdown, they tended to be loyal to Charles, because he was a way better option than the Protestant hardliners found everywhere else in the government. Which brings us to the curious case of Sir George Calvert. Despite converting to Catholicism, I'm not sure he ever paid anything to anyone. Nor have I read of any specific instance where the penal laws applied to him. Yes, he did lose his place in the Privy Council, and his religion will make things awkward for him down the line. I mean, I think he could have had a much easier time of it just staying a Protestant. But at the same time, King Charles is waiving fees Calvert owes him on his Irish estates. Charles is granting Calvert and his family travel rights into Ireland. Most extraordinarily of all, he's letting an openly Catholic member of the Spanish party install an openly Catholic governor into an English colony, all while there's a war with Spain going on. And while it can look like Calvert was sort of fleeing England, he still had estates there, lands which he could have lost in their entirety if the authorities really thought he was running for it. The level of trust Charles must have had for Calvert is remarkable. And for his part, Calvert, as always, is demonstrably loyal and always trying to make himself useful to the crown. The pittance he'd be paying in recusancy fines is nothing compared to the amount of investment he was putting into expanding English interests in the New World. And Charles could probably do the math here, and would protect and encourage Calvert as much as he could. But Calvert represented an elite, a minority within a minority. For many Catholics, and especially the Catholic clergy, things were much harder. And this is what Father Simon Stock was immersing himself into when he returns to England in 1615. And for about five years, he's off the radar. We're not exactly sure what he was up to at that time, but I like to imagine him going underground, basically living out the lyrics of life during wartime. Because I'm sure whatever he was up to, it wasn't a party, it wasn't a disco, nor was it any fooling around. But at some point, he starts to make connections. Some Genoese merchants turned him on to the right people and he got his foot in the door at the Spanish embassy. And this is all right around the time of the Spanish match. He will become Count Gondomar's confessor, so he's right in the middle of it all. And this is likely how he eventually met George Calvert. And Stock will claim to have converted Calvert himself. We already discussed Calvert's conversion back in episode 1.3, and my opinion remains the same. I think Stock may have been one of the first Catholic priests Calvert went to for a confession or something like that. Mostly because the Spanish embassy was one of the few places in London which legally contained a chapel and Catholic priests. But as far as Stock's missionary work having a direct effect on converting Calvert, I have serious doubts. The thing about Simon Stock is, he takes credit for everything. It's actually kind of a running joke in almost any of the histories I've read about him, even some of the 19th century histories. He has this almost pathological tendency to put himself in the middle of events that he's mostly just a witness to or that he's only vaguely aware of. The simple reason for this is that Father Simon was ambitious. And his dream throughout these years is to start an English novitiate in Brussels for his Carmelite order. He wants to put them up in the same league as the Jesuits and the Benedictines. So he wants a specific school to train English Carmelite priests for the English mission. In late 1623, he writes the Belgian nuncio to this end. And a nuncio is a papal envoy or ambassador residing in a Catholic country or court. 
And Simon Stock can do this because he has the rare luxury of being able to safely correspond by letter, thanks to his connection to the Spanish Embassy. His dispatches are going through embassy channels, so his letters aren't being intercepted and he isn't being nabbed by the English authorities. This nuncio in Brussels passes Stock's request on to a new organization in Rome, called the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, or the Propaganda Fide. And propaganda was established by Papal Bull in 1622 as a sort of centralized intelligence hub, with the purpose of spreading and protecting the faith in all of the non-Catholic areas of the world. So both the English mission and any mission in North America would fall under their jurisdiction. What they want is information, intelligence, about what is going on in the ground in England and any developments that might be important for the English mission. For decades, English authorities and spy networks had demolished steady lines of communication between the Roman church authorities and priests and laity living there. Most of what little information they could glean was usually third-hand rumors derived from ambassadors, nuncios, and a few priests scattered throughout the underground. So they were keen to maintain a correspondence with this Carmelite in England. And for his part, Simon Stock could try and leverage his usefulness to propaganda to achieve his ambitions. And if he has to pad his resume a bit by making himself out to be the center of everything going on there, well, there aren't too many people who could call him out on it. In November 1624, he writes to Propaganda, claiming, I have gained for our Lord by his grace two counselors of the King's Privy Council, the most intelligent and sufficient men that are of the Royal Privy Council. One of those newly converted Privy Councilors died a few months later, so we won't bother about him, but the other one was definitely Calvert. And what Calvert ultimately wanted from Stock was two or three Catholic priests who could accompany them on the next expedition to Avalon. And suddenly, all of this ammunition is dropped right in Stock's lap. A new mission to the new world to start a colony for English Catholics and gain a foothold for the Roman Church in North America. Now, Catholic priests had followed the Spanish and the Portuguese explorers and conquistadors into the West Indies, Central America, and South America a century earlier and had firm roots in those places already. But North America was wide open. There was a Spanish foothold in Florida, and the French were just beginning to do some missionary work in Canada. But everywhere in between was being claimed by Protestants, like the English, the Dutch, and later the Swedes. These lands were being colonized in greater numbers by these heretics, who in turn were proselytizing native populations with their foul corruption of the true church. And it's this need to convert North America before the Protestant heretics beat them to it, which Stock stresses in his letters to propaganda. And it's not just North America at risk. Stock would also sell Avalon as an important stepping stone to converting the Far East. And that logic might sound kind of weird to you, but that's probably because you have some basic idea of what the world actually looks like in map or globe form. One of the driving theories behind the exploration and colonization of this region of North America was that there was a Northwest Passage to the Pacific. You know, by sailing west through North America or over the top of it, you could reach the Pacific and sail on to the Orient. This is what drove guys like John Cabot to discover Newfoundland. And other great explorers like Henry Hudson would push further and further west into what's now called the Hudson Bay. And the sea before them would open up and it really seemed like if they just went a little bit further they could find the Pacific. And we know now that their theory was right. You can cut across to the Pacific from eastern Canada. You'd just have to sail through a sea of ice and a tiny wooden ship with no hope of resupply for thousands of miles in some of the most merciless conditions on the planet. And this centuries-long quest would rack up a body count on its explorers, including Hudson. Regardless, by 1625, it's been the general feeling for decades that when the Northwest Passage is finally found, and that should be any day now, Newfoundland's going to become prime real estate. It's right there on the eastern edge of the route. This is part of what drove Sir Humphrey Gilbert there. It's part of the reason Calvert is willing to risk so much in colonizing there. And for Father Simon Stock, it's the potential shortcut to Asia and millions of new souls to save. But only if the Holy Church can get there before the heretics spoil everything. Now it has to be said, the idea of creating an English colony as a haven for Catholics is not a new one. Neither Calvert or Stock invented this idea. It's not even the first time Newfoundland was potentially a site for such a colony. 
Way back in 1578, Sir Humphrey Gilbert was turning over any stone he could to get funding for a voyage to the Americas. And he ended up falling in with some Catholic investors who would lend him the lolly if he helped them set up a Catholic colony in Newfoundland. And those are some strange bedfellows. The Catholic aristocracy and Sir Humphrey, I'll cut your ears off if you talk bad about the Queen Gilbert. But, you know, any port in a storm. Anyway, the authorities caught wind and put the kibosh on those plans fast. A Catholic colony was quite out of the question. The idea came up again around 1604, 1605, just before the gunpowder plot, funny enough. This time, some Catholic nobles looked to start a colony in Norumbega. And Norumbega didn't actually exist. It was just this area to the west of Newfoundland that appeared on an early 16th century map, and it was taken as fact for most of a century until they went over there and, you know, discovered Maine. And the fascinating thing about this period is just how little common knowledge there was of the New World. I mean, forget Google and Wikipedia. There isn't even the accumulated collective knowledge of the previous 400 years to rely on. There's only a few maps and charts, most of which either suck or are being jealously guarded or hidden. There would be a flurry of books and pamphlets coming out by the early 1620s, you know, true accounts of those who had been there. But they were often fantastical. I mean, even Richard Whitbourne recounts seeing a mermaid in St. John's Harbor. Or they're specifically playing up just how temperate and fertile the place is in order to attract colonizers. Most of these books are quite limited in quantity and localized in distribution. Plus, you know, how many people can actually read? You really just have the words of a few captains, pilots, sailors, and settlers as hard evidence. So North America is sometimes more conceptual than real in these early stages. But in spite of this, or maybe more likely because of it, people are willing to dump their life savings into trying to get there, or at least profit from it in some way. The proposed Catholic colony in Norumbega would be kiboshed, this time not by the English authorities, but by the Catholic Church. Robert Parsons, the head Jesuit at the English College in Rome, stuck a pin in the whole idea. He said, A, the crown will never allow this. B, rich Catholics will never move out of their posh homes, and the poor ones couldn't afford to. And C, you're diverting energy from the way more important goal of the English mission. But now, 20 years down the road, things had changed. Apparently, a Catholic aristocrat is being allowed to start a colony, and the Protestants are winning the race to convert North America. And so Stock's message finds purchase. By March 1625, his letters are being read in front of His Holiness himself, Pope Urban VIII. And cardinals in Rome then got in touch with the head of the Carmelite order and said, you know, your man in England is on to something here. You need to help him out. The Carmelite general says, you know, oh yeah, we're on it. And in no time flat, Propaganda is writing Father Simon with the good news. Two Carmelite priests are on their way. Fill them in with what they need to know when they get there, and then get them on that ship with Sir Arthur Aston and get them to Avalon. Bit, bam, boom. But to Stock's consternation, these two priests seem to be dragging their feet and getting there. Stock continues to write propaganda, still feeding them information, but imploring them to get the gears moving a little faster. Time was running out. Aston was going to sail. But May comes and goes, and Aston sails off without those priests. When they finally arrive later that summer, Fathers Bede and Elias, the two priests, inform Stock that there's no way they're going to the edge of the known world. And actually, Father Bede was here to replace Simon as the head of the English mission for the Carmelite order. Stock desperately beseeches propaganda over and over. You know, these guys you sent me, they're not going to work out. They're actually actively hindering the Avalon mission. Please send someone else. But by this time, Father Bede and the higher-ups of the Carmelite Order are sending their own reports to propaganda, ones which aren't so optimistic about Avalon. But they're not trying to get in the way of sending any priests. In fact, they have the perfect candidate to send over to the other side of the ocean, Father Simon Stock. It's his idea. Who better to go? By early 1626, Stock is being commanded to go to Avalon himself by the head of his order, and by mid-1626, propaganda has followed suit, telling Stock he was the man for the job. To which Stock would reply, Me? Ooh, I'm more of an idea guy. Plus, I have uh, very important work to do here in England still. Uh, very important work to do here in England. And he kind of had a point. By 1626, Simon was essentially the last Carmelite in England. He was the English mission as far as that particular order was concerned. Out of five Carmelites, including Stock, 
Two others were too sick and infirm to perform their basic duties. Both Bede and Elias had been captured and thrown in jail within a matter of months after arriving in England, something Stock could barely contain his sense of righteous satisfaction about. And a lot of this is essentially recognizable as workplace politics. Stock's own order ignored him for years, so he went over their head and started communicating with the head office in Rome, which naturally created resentment amongst his immediate superiors from his order, who, when it came down to it, still had more pull with Rome than Stock did. It's the same sort of drama you can find working at the Gulp and Go or the Piggly Wiggly, only with the slightly more high-pressure setting involving years in jail, possible torture and execution, and the potential salvation or damnation of all humankind. But there was a deeper current of factional dysfunction going on in the English Catholic underground at the time that had been fomenting for years. The fault line of this controversy ran roughly between the regulars and the seculars, and split opinions amongst the English Catholic laity. Despite a few occasional periods where things relaxed a bit for Catholics, such as during the height of the Spanish match, portions of the 1630s, and after the restoration of the Stuarts, each time there was inevitably a Protestant backlash. Plotted out on a graph, the overall trajectory for the religion in England was steadily downwards. It was a depressing state of affairs for those on the ground, risking their freedom, their lives, and their fortunes to try and maintain a foothold for the true church, and for those who were just trying to be proper Catholics. And when they looked around for a reason why things weren't coming together for them, many English Catholics blamed the lack of harmony between the ecclesiastical factions and the lack of focus and purpose for the English mission all around. There was also the consistent and nagging feeling that without a proper church structure and hierarchy, that maybe they weren't doing it right. Did these handful of priests and monks sneaking around the country genuinely have the spiritual power and faculties to dispense with the sacraments? When they performed baptisms, marriages, mass, or when they heard confessions, or gave last rites to the dying, did it count? Maybe it didn't. And what does that mean for their souls? Many Catholics felt that the solution to all of these quandaries was to start taking the English mission seriously. It was time to turn England into something more like a true Catholic diocese. What they wanted was a bishop. One man who could cut through the factionalism, who could bring focus and legitimacy to the protection and propagation of Catholicism in England. Things had kind of been evolving this way in the English underground for decades. And while there were no true Catholic bishops, a sort of ceremonial position grew out of this desire, that of the archpriest. A sort of first among priests who'd act as a focal point for the mission. And early on, the regular clergy lent some support to this idea. So long as the archpriest didn't go off half-cocked and think he could start ordering everyone around like a real bishop. This would definitively change in April 1625, with the arrival in England of Richard Smith, the titular Bishop of Chalcedon. And while the Chalcedon designation means there was no true existing Catholic diocese for him to be a bishop over, he'd take a more literal approach to his title. Simply put, there was a new sheriff in town, and he was intent on bringing the whole of the English mission under his thumb. For the first year or so in England, Smith will be too busy hiding to stir the pot effectively. So we'll leave the details of this controversy for the next couple of podcasts. I just want you to know that this piece was on the board, and the storm's a brewin. And before long, Calvert is going to find himself on the front lines of this factional flame war, and it will have consequences down the line for the colony of Maryland. For now, we're going to leave it there. It's been six months since the last podcast, and that's three or four months too long, even for me. This episode and the next have been extra excruciating for me to research and write because there is so little out there. I've had to rewrite and re-record multiple times due to new information. So if these next two episodes seem a little more Frankenstein-y than usual, that's why. Maybe I should have just skipped it all together. But the more I did learn, the more it seems to me this is an essential period in the story of the Calverts into the lead-up of establishing Maryland. And it's a period you just don't hear much about. Mostly because there isn't that much about it. I had to do a lot more research compared to previous episodes. And two sources in particular have been absolutely essential for today's podcast. The first is Luca Cavagnola's The Coldest Harbor of the Land, Simon Stock and Lord Baltimore's Colony of Newfoundland, 1621-1649. to 
basically anything touching on this subject after 1988 uses this book as their source. Unfortunately, that means it's expensive. Even the ebook version is like $70. I lucked out and got it for about 40 bucks after two months of watching Amazon and eBay. Fortunately, though, the second essential source is free to download. It's Thomas Aloysius Hughes's History of the Society of Jesus in North America, Colonial and Federal. And though it's copyrighted 1908, it's been the gem of a read. There's all kinds of interesting little nuggets from an ecclesiastical perspective, and I think it'll be useful for many episodes to come. Our next episode will be episode four, because if you haven't noticed, I'm finally ditching the whole silly numbering system I got myself caught up in. Shh! Yeah, it all started out kind of accidentally, and I ran with it, thinking maybe I could make them into chapters or something. But I'm repeatedly finding myself trapped writing-wise by my own conceptual structure. So I'm nixing it now before I end up having an episode 2.4Z-7 or something. And hopefully that will free me up to write just something about a specific subject and just stop there. And maybe it will increase my output a little. But don't hold your breath. Next time, on episode 4... We're going to continue delving into the mysterious and often overlooked period between 1625 and 1627. This time, we'll follow the Calverts into Ireland and learn a bit about how they fit into the Irish political scene. We'll meet George Calvert's new wife, the first Lady Baltimore. And we'll be doing a little catching up with the Calvert children, the ones who are still alive anyway. We'll also revisit Simon Stock and see what he has to say about Sir Arthur Aston's trip to Avalon because stock is virtually the only source on any of it. And once again, there will be plenty of speculation to trying to fill in the missing gaps. These couple of years will also coincide with Charles and Buckingham engaging in a series of military and foreign diplomatic disasters that will only add to conflicts at home between the king and the parliament and keep the tiny snowball King James kicked down the hill growing in size and intensity on its course towards civil war. These grand political events will affect Calvert directly in multiple ways, and will ultimately force him to personally take the reins of governing his distant colony of Avalon. I'd like to thank you for listening, and apologize again for the ridiculous gap in episodes. And I will be racing to get the next episode done before I get caught up in the soul-crushing hellscape that is running a seafood department during the holidays. Until then, we can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and YouTube. And I implore you all to rock on. Hey.